From the very beginning when I started repairing engines, especially on the vintage ones, I found it incredibly frustrating to not be able to get my hands on the parts that I needed to get the machine up and running as it should. And I'd always considered getting myself a mini lathe, but at three, four thousand dollars for a benchtop mini lathe, it was just out of my budget as a hobbyist just working from my shop at home. And I'd automatically discounted getting a cheaper lathe than that thinking that the $500 lathes were just going to be complete junk and not worth the time and effort that would be required to get them up and running as they should. And it wasn't until Vivor reached out to me, asking if I wanted to review it, and I could give my complete, honest and unbiased opinion that I said yes, and I finally got my hands on one. In today's short video, we're going to go over unboxing, setting up the lathe, making some parts, testing how accurate it is, and then at the end of the video, I'll give you my feedback and whether I think it's actually worth you investing that money into it. So along with the lathe, you have your user manual, instruction manual, and the parts list, and a toolbox as well. And it comes with a few fairly basic tools. You have a pair of spanners. They're 14 millimeters, two of them on one end, and 17 on the other. Then you have the four feet that can go underneath the lathe. You have the dead center, the gears for cutting threads and engaging the lead screw, the four bolts to hold the feet down, and a set of Allen keys, a few knobs to go onto the machine, as well as the jaws, the second set of jaws. This is a seven by 14 lathe, that's seven inches over the bed, 14 inches between center, but note that over the carriage you do lose a few inches, so that takes you down to about five inches over the carriage. And it comes with a chuck key, the chuck key actually has a little spring on it, I removed it because I found it a bit frustrating. And the little plastic guard seems a little bit anemic, I suppose it does its job, but I ended up removing that as well. And it's just a couple of bolts on the back. And by removing the side cover, you can actually see the banjo. And this allows you to engage and disengage the lead screw for thread cutting and automatic feeding of the carriage left and right. You also have access to all the gears, which can be interchanged depending on what thread pitch that you want to cut or the speed that you want that lead screw to run at. Each one of the gears is numbered and this corresponds to the numbers on the side panel as well. You have A, B, C and D, depending on the position of the gears, as well as the teeth and then the pitch as well. So by matching those up, you can set the pitch and the speed of that lead screw. The control panel is really simple. You've got your on off switch, your direction, and then your speed. Now this is a variable speed lathe from zero all the way up to two and a half thousand RPM. And on a mini lathe, that can be quite convenient with the small pieces that you're gonna be turning. And here on the skirt, you've got the lever to engage and disengage the half nuts onto the lead screw so that you can use the power feed setup, again, for thread cutting, or if you just want automatic feeding of the carriage left and right. The gibs don't come adjusted from factory, so there's a huge amount of play in the skirt, carriage, cross slide, and the compound, and it's gonna just increase vibrations, and it's not safe to use as it is. It is really simple to adjust these gibs though. So you just loosen off the lock nuts, snug up each one of the grub screws so that the slide or compound can't move, back them off about a quarter of a turn, and then tighten them slightly until you can feel that they just start to put a little bit of resistance on the thread on the screw, and then lock them back down again and move on to the next one. And once adjusted correctly, there should be minimal play, but you should still be able to move the carriage back and forth across its length. To adjust the tool post, you have to back it all the way off and it'll expose these two Allen head bolts. Just loosen them and then you can rotate that however you wish and just snug them back down again. The tail stock is a cam lever style. I did notice it was bumping against the uh, chip guard there, but it's no big deal. It's just something I noticed when I was working and actuating it. I did notice though that the carriage doesn't come with a lock and that's going to be a problem when you're doing facing cuts. So I got some aluminium 12 by 12 mil square stock and I filed a couple of flats in it, drilled a hole and tapped it, drilled a hole in the carriage and that just allowed me to put a bolt in there, tighten that down and that would lock the carriage in place. It's really simple to do and it's certainly worthwhile doing because if you don't, whenever you're doing a facing cut, it's actually going to cause it to be a little bit convex rather than flat.
And this is where things start to go downhill drastically. This lathe is cutting a taper. And that is the further away you go from the headstock, the tighter or the smaller it's cutting. In this case, it's 0.05 mil for every centimeter. And that's just way too much. This is a non-adjustable headstock, and therefore it makes the lathe almost unusable. And so I spoke to a couple of friends, and they suggested to use feeder gauges as shims to be able to move the headstock round. So you take the headstock off, you place a shim in, bolt it back down, cut a length of metal, and just measure the taper until you're getting no taper whatsoever. And in this case, I managed to get it down to two microns of taper across about five centimeters. And if you're not sure what that is, as a bit of perspective, that's two thousandths of a millimeter taper across five centimeters, more accurate than any home machinist will ever need. And so let's now make something. I'm gonna go with the brass nut and bolt as my first project. It covers all the basic fundamental skills of using a metal lathe. So in summary, I highly recommend it. Yes, you're going to have to put some time and effort in with disassembly, cleaning it up, maybe removing a few burrs, possibly doing a bit of shimming of the headstock, but really it's all very minor stuff that anyone can do at home. And if you're prepared to do it, and there's so many videos online, it's going to open up a whole new world of being able to make parts that you need that you can't get hold of. And I've stuck a link in the description if you want 5% more off, then you can click that, go through the process of ordering it, and I hope you enjoy the lathe as much as I do and be able to make those parts that you can no longer get hold of. And if you enjoyed today's video, I've got this one up here, which is the heaviest, largest machine that I've worked on, which is a 100 kilo Honda Wacker Packer that had stopped working. I take the whole thing apart. I hope you enjoy that video. Until next time, I'll catch you soon.